Welcome, welcome everybody, everyone to a Science Thursday with Brookhaven Lab. I am Aleida Perez uh, from Brookhaven's uh, Office of Educational Programs, and I'm joined by my colleague Diana Murphy, who will be managing the Q&A portion of the discussion today. Uh, before I introduce our guest, uh, so a few reminders. Uh, you can submit your questions using the Q&A chat section. We will try. To, we will. We will try to answer as or to get as many questions as we can, as we can today. If you have any issues or difficulties with our video stream, just please let IT know, and you can do so by making a comment in the chat set, chat section. Okay. So today I am joined by my uh, compatriota, my Puerto Rican fellow, uh, Luis, uh, Dr. Luis Tancor. He's an analytical chemist in the field of catalysis here at Brookhaven's chemistry department. Um, and his research is focused, is focused on catalysis, on catalysis uh, which we'll get in, the, in a great detail shortly. So welcome, Luis. How are you? Um, hello, Aleda, and hello to the audience. Uh, I am very good. Thank you for having me today in this event. Uh, I am happy and excited to share some of the science that is currently being done here at Brookhaven National Laboratory, specifically in the catalysis, reactivity, and structure group. Awesome. It's a pleasure having you here today, and I'm looking forward to the conversation and the people, you know, putting their, their questions in our chat. Uh, Luis, as, as we mentioned earlier, you're a chemist uh, in catalysis, so, you know, which is a process that we think about increasing the rate of chemical reactions, you know, by adding or using a catalyst. So before we even start, let's just get our audience um, on the same mindset. What is a what is a catalyst? Well, a catalyst. Um, I consider a catalyst to be the heart of chemical reactions. Catalysts are vital in the production of uh, manufacturing, like gasoline, plastics, artificial fertilizer, amongst others products, and to produce them to the quantities that are needed to supply it in our society. So what is a catalyst uh, specifically? A catalyst is a compound that accelerates the rate of chemical reactions. So the process by which this happens is called catalysis. Now, catalysts are very efficient. And just to put um, a mild example, uh, imagine you have two identical production plants. Um, they are producing ammonia as fertilizers. One of them is using a catalyst and the other one is not. Um, you can notice that the one that uh, is using the catalyst is able to produce approximately 1 million tons of ammonia more, I mean, 1, 1 million tons of ammonia, whereas the one that doesn't have the catalyst can only produce one ton. So that means that the catalyst is able to speed the rate of the reaction 1 million fold. Now, that is why catalyst is completely indispensable for the industry and for society. Um, if without them, we could not mass produce most of the products that we use every day and take for granted. Now, how does a catalyst work? Well, a catalyst is able to reduce the bonding energy between atoms and molecules. So this makes it much easier uh, for molecules to react and form the desired products. Yes, and so uh, without those chemicals, things like plastics, right? Things like the, the the way we manufacture some of our products will take for you know forever. It, it will not be something that will be a commercially you know monetarily viable to do. Um, we would not be alive if if it we weren't for, uh, for for catalysts. Yes, because, correct. Uh, in our body, we, we have them. them. Yeah, we have them in our body. Yeah, we not have it in our body. If you know, you think about uh, biologists, and this is my background. You know, our body functions the way it functions because we have this proteins that acts that uh, enzymes that are the catalysts in the chemical reactions uh, that our body has to do. Even the simple things, right? Uh, cars. Correct, and also. Water. Yeah, and also in nature, uh, uh, the f uh, photo. Photosynthesis is basically a catalytic process where Correct. where you convert uh, carbon dioxide and water into sugars and oxygen. Correct. So, so they're, they're everywhere. They're, they're everywhere. The integral of chemistry is an integral part of our life, I will say. Uh, so, That's why I say um, it's the heart of chemical reaction. 
indeed 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 and so um if you think about you know and, and i guess we, as we talk about the research that you do uh what what makes a good catalyst what makes uh, what it has what a catalyst what that chemical properties are that make them a good catalyst well when we talk about uh, catalysts, uh, we evaluate them in terms of activity, which means uh, how much reactant you can convert into product. We evaluate them in terms of stability, for how long can you keep this activity for, and we also evaluate in terms of selectivity. Um, mm -hmm. Using different catalysts can achieve different products. So um, a good catalyst is able to have a high activity, have a high stability and it forms the desired product for the chemical reaction which you're studying. Correct. Right. So let's so with that in mind or with that uh you know with that setup, can you tell us a mm -hmm. little bit about the kind of research that you do here at Brookhaven Lab? Well as of now I am studying uh carbon dioxide reduction. Um, you may be fairly aware of carbon dioxide because you've yeah. heard it recently because it's probably it's a uh, greenhouse gas pollutant and greenhouse gas pollutant have been associated to climate change and climate change is one of our society's biggest problems at present some of its effects are rising sea levels longer mm -hmm. periods of drought more intense storms and even mm -hmm. the melting of the ice caps so it is extremely likely that the warming of the planet is being uh, influenced by humans because humans mm -hmm. we generate the most uh, the, the most of the total greenhouse gas emitted in the form of carbon dioxide due to fossil fuel usage mm -hmm. and our atmosphere which uh, uh, is able to absorb some of the carbon dioxide has already been saturated with the maximum amount of carbon dioxide without, without having any uh, uh, deleterious effect in climate so not only do we need to stop releasing the amount of carbon dioxide that we're re releasing every single year, we need to find strategies uh, that are available to remove it from the atmosphere. And this is where my research comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, in here in, the, in Brookhaven National Lab, in the Catalysis Reactivity Structure Group, we're, finding, we're trying to find uh, strategies in order to convert carbon dioxide into value-added chemicals. And this is known as chemical conversion of carbon dioxide. Um, if you're able to convert carbon dioxide into, for example, methanol, which is a useful chemical, you can right. potentially uh, use, uh, create what's called a carbon neutral cycle, where mm -hmm. you oxidize methanol and use it as a fuel, produce carbon dioxide, and then the mm -hmm. carbon dioxide, you sequester it, and then you can produce uh, methanol. Uh, and this is like an endless loop and endless mm -hmm. cycle. Now, unfortunately, carbon dioxide is a very stable molecule. Correct. So that means that it's very unlikely to react in standard conditions. So not only does it have a high energetic barrier, it also is kinetically really, really slow. So it requires an active catalyst that's able to speed the rate of the reaction. And with the right catalyst, we can activate the carbon-oxygen bond and steer the selectivity towards a product that it's useful for using. And that's basically what we're trying to do, convert greenhouse gas pollutants into something useful. And not only carbon dioxide, we're also working with methane, which is also, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think, it. about 10 times as potent as carbon dioxide. So you're looking for whatever, whatever those catalysts a catalyst that can move that reaction forward in a in a more fast and an efficient way that then you can either that that leads to the product that you desire whether it's alcohol whether it's the alcohol or even carbon other carbon based materials right because i think you're also looking into the hydrocarbon piece of that as well that is correct um i use the uh, always methanol because it's like uh something that you can probably heard heard of but mm -hmm. yeah indeed like if you're able to uh reduce carbon dioxide dioxide selectively into other forms of if to carbon monoxide for example then you can uh there's a there's a reaction where you can turn carbon monoxide into 
uh, other forms of hydrocarbons. And this is also used for, uh, for creating materials and synthesis of materials. So yeah, basically so, the catalyst, what it does is it steers the selectivity towards the product mm -hmm. that you're looking for. That you're looking for, exactly. Yeah. So I hear that you, so you, you are used, so let me see something here. So there's a question that it came on the chat. Let me ask for it. Will different catalysts yield different products? That is an excellent question. And absolutely, different catalysts and different arrangement of the catalyst can yield different products. Um, in our in our work, uh, we not only work with the with the metal, which is the catalyst. Uh, we also have to optimize the um, the, we have to optimize it in terms of the nanostructure. So different sizes, different morphologies, and uh, different interaction that you have with your catalyst can yield different reaction products. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, just to remind a few folks, if you uh, would like to ask Luisa questions, please use, use the Q&A button for the chat section on, your, on, on the right side of the BlueGene uh, web uh, browser application. That's big. So there are different products. So um, I, so you look at the different type of what that mature, what that chemical, that catalyst will look like. And it is my own. As far as I, when I was speaking to you, you mentioned that you use some tools at the laboratory to do your studies to to understand what is the role of these chemicals. And I, so I hear that you are a light source user and you use the light source as a tool. Can you talk a little um, bit about that? Of course, and that is correct. Um, I remember when I was uh, taking my high school courses in chemistry, they always talk about atoms and molecules, but you're not actually able to see them. So it's a little hard to actually to have the correct mindset. Now, um, here in the laboratory, uh, as we're looking at catalysts, um, you can probably look at a catalyst, uh, how it works before and after. You can you mm -hmm. can practically do uh, characterization techniques that allow you to look at the catalyst before the reaction and after the reaction, and this gives us uh, some information. But here at Brookhaven National Lab, we have the tools to actually look at the catalyst during the reaction, and this is something that is uh, very interesting. Uh, and the way that we do it is you is using the synchrotron. The synchrotron is a high uh, is a source of uh, very bright X-rays, and by shining light into the catalyst as we're using it, we're able to look at very closely at what's called the active site and the active uh, yeah the active site of the catalyst, and we're able to define what makes the catalyst uh, a good catalyst. So the uh, the by using the tools over at the synchrotron, we're able to tell. The elemental composition of the catalyst, of the catalyst as the reaction takes place. Mm -hmm. We're also able to see the crystal structure, which relates obviously, which relates to the properties of the material. Right. And we're also able to see the adsorbates. So what species are reacting at the surface of the catalyst? Mm -hmm. That's actually it's, it's, a, it's a lot of information that you get from the from that you know from the use of the X-ray. In a single, almost yeah. in a single experiment, you can get a lot of information uh, in terms of how, you know, what is as the as reaction happens, right? What is the state of your right. chemical that is driving that reaction? It's very cool. Like Correct. That. And I think one of the most interesting things is that um, when you think about a material, how good it is, like you probably, OK, this material is very good, but why is it good? And yes. these are the answers that we're trying to tackle here. So it's more of a fundamental aspect of why a catalyst mm -hmm. works. And this allows us to design better catalysts. Yeah, and I actually, uh, so I, I think it's actually very cool. There's one question in the chat, and I'm going to ask you. Catalysts for carbon dioxide reduction in gas or liquid form? I guess the question is, what is, is, is the catalyst that is used for carbon dioxide reduction in what kind of catalyst? Is used for carbon dioxide reduction in a gas or a liquid form. I guess that's what oh, the question is I think, I think I understand the question. And yeah. it's a, so we're doing heterogeneous catalysis, and the interface is gas solid interface. Um, 
of course uh you can have the, there are different catalysts for different uh, mm -hmm. interfaces right. you can you can also dissolve the co2 in water and then use a solid catalyst to to do the reduction but in our case the our group is working with uh hetero solid and gas interface there's another group here at brookhaven national laboratory and we're and we're also collaborating with them that also mm -hmm. does uh electrochemistry it is basically electrochemistry which is a co2 reduction in aqueous media thank you so 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 um when you think about so i'm going to go back to to the to the research that you're doing because i think it's a very it's, it's a very fundamental you're asking a very fundamental scientific question that yes if you know if we understand those those processes then it has a great application like you mentioned in terms of taking those carbon uh, greenhouse pollutants and converting them into um uh, value-added materials creating um, a greenhouse uh, CO uh, a carbon dioxide neutral environment and so I think this is about this an important what I'm trying to say is, is that there is a very important uh, showing the, the importance of basic science right and the importance of this right. basic science in such in the applications that, that that it does that it happens um, at the light source um, you uh you are there you use the x-rays just a very curious question how long do the experiment takes when you go there and do this experiment uh uh you know in vivo or as is as it happening okay so when i go to the synchrotron every experience is different uh, i i've had i've been going to the light source since 2012 and mm -hmm. there's not a single there's not a single day uh, experiment time that things go 100 percent as they should so there's a lot of troubleshooting involved because most of the times we have to build the gas lines that mm -hmm. in, in the light source so this takes a lot of time and also setting up the experiment it it's um, trying to model what we have in the lab and go into the light source it takes a lot of time and and we have to act to make it as accurate as possible uh, as the conditions that we're using in, here in the laboratory mm -hmm. and but the time wise these experiments take approximately six hours but setting up the experiment probably takes between 20 and 22 hours probably more than wow. yeah it's a long it's day a lot of time. for you <laughs> It's it's a full day. Every time we have uh, we have theme time, we know that mm -hmm. we're gonna stay there for a couple of days, and there are shifts. There are twenty four hour shifts. Mhm, mm mhm, mm mhm. Mm but it's uh, but it's it, but it's an amazing tool, and you learn a lot uh, from the the experience because you also work alongside beamline scientists, and mm -hmm. it's it's truly a really uh, rewarding process. Mhm. Mm so. Um, I have, um, I guess, my my next question for you, um, as we as we continue our conversation, is that uh, what do you think it's as the field moves forward? What do you think are the next steps into this type of research of the catalysis research? What is next hmm, for the, the next? The next. The thing? next step for the catalysis field. Um, mm -hmm. I think that I've, I mean, I've been doing research eight years right now in, in fundamental, in what's called fundamental science. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that one important aspect of research is trying to integrate it into uh, the many steps of energy production. Because right now I am working with, um, I, I have been working on trying to convert carbon dioxide into uh, into methanol, but one of the problems is also that we're producing carbon uh, dioxide at such a high rate that we also need to integrate other types of technologies that are able to produce energy and and, uh, and not rely on fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if we, and, and I'm going to give you an example. Like 10 years ago, uh, I've heard a lot about I was I was doing research and I was always uh, seeing hydrogen that was it that was to become the next fuel source and it was gonna uh, we were gonna have hydrogen fuel cells until instead of uh, engines 
And it really sounds amazing. I mean, if you have water and you can split water into hydrogen and oxygen and then use hydrogen as a fuel source, then the uh, only oxidation product will be water. But it's a lot more complicated than that. And uh, splitting hydrogen and water is energy intensive. So you have to have energy in order to obtain energy. So I feel like uh, in research, we need to integrate all of these uh, different steps in order to actually build a very robust infrastructure. So for this, we, we would have to work alongside the industry and we, right. we also would need like critical, uh, uh, it would need uh, like a very good incentive to actually work alongside people who actually can, can mass produce the catalysts that we make and, mm -hmm. and build a robust uh, infrastructure. So I think this is the next thing that um, is gonna happen eventually in this field. Do you use a lot of uh, modeling, computation modeling on your experiments? You know, thinking that you can't, there's no way, it's, in, it's challenging to test every single chemical that might be, you know, that might function or my, that you're looking for in terms of the, the uh, most ideal catalyst for, for uh, to, to, to convert CO2, CO2. So do you use a lot of modeling in terms of, um, uh, in, as part of your research? Computational modeling? Uh, our group actually has a modeling. Uh, our group is mm -hmm. also one third a modeling group. And when you talk about modeling, uh, it's basically uh, using the energetics, uh, knowing the energetics of the reaction mm -hmm. and the molecular and the energetics of the structure of the of the chemical of the catalyst, and then you're able to model what the reaction would be right. based. Mathem completely mathematically, so it mm -hmm. really saves a lot of time. And yes, uh, part of the screening of the catalyst uh, is done using computational methods. But not only the screening of the catalyst is, is done using computational methods, but whenever we have a a mechanism, like we we use the catalyst and we're able to tell what the mechanism is based on the on the techniques that I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. we also like to corroborate it with computational methods yes. because computational methods give us an extra uh, incentive that energetically and mathematically what we're proposing is correct. So definitely computational and, methods are vital. And vice are versa, very right? Important. Important yes, you, absolutely. You can, and then you can use computation to protect certain pathways and then you corroborate or certain energies and then see if that matches out experimentally as well. So I think it's, uh, yes. it's a double way. There's a question on the chat. Why is methane mm -hmm. 10 times more potent than carbon dioxide? Why is methane 10 times more potent than more carbon potent dioxide? Than carbon so, dioxide. so, so, Methane is a greenhouse gas pollutant. And why is it 10 times more potent than, than carbon dioxide? Well, I don't really know the answer to that question, but, by, but I know what it means to be more potent. It means that mm -hmm. it's able to absorb uh, infrared, I mean, to absorb uh, uh, light more strongly. Mm -hmm. so, so that means that whenever like the light bounces from the earth, the it, it hits the molecule of methane and it basically bounces it, uh, absorbs it. So the, the, uh, the photon is not able to leave. So that, that means that it's much more efficient at absorbing uh, radiation. Thank you. There's another question on the chat, Luis. How large of an effect do you foresee carbon dioxide reduction will have and how efficient would this process be? Okay. Uh, what was the first question? How large of a how large of an effect do you foresee carbon dioxide reduction will have? How, okay. Um, I think that a carbon dioxide reduction really has the potential for uh, lowering our current greenhouse gas emissions. But mm -hmm. as I was telling you uh, before, not only carbon dioxide is the only strategy that will be able to mitigate the amount of, of carbon uh, dioxide in the atmosphere. We need to also integrate other types of technologies. We need to find ways right. to produce um, energy without the, the, the use of 
uh, without burning fossil fuels because this is ultimately mm -hmm. this is the main drawback that we're facing right now. Uh, we're creating so much CO2, and if we compare it to the amount of CO2 that we're able to convert, it's really not adding up, you know? Uh, just to put it into perspective, uh, I was reading an article the other day that even with the COVID situation in which we're living in, um, where probably more than half the population is staying at homes and it's releasing less carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we've only been able to lower greenhouse uh, CO2 emissions by 8% compared to last year. So eventually, if, if climate change gets even worse, um, I would foresee that we have to be more uh, critical in terms of treating mm -hmm. carbon dioxide because even with when ha with half the pop more than half the population uh, changing their usual habits, we're still creating so much carbon dioxide that it, it's really incredible. But yeah, mm -hmm. hopefully this is a strategy, and there are probably going to be other strategies that we can also integrate and build a, a robust infrastructure which is what i would hope for the future yeah and i guess that ties to the second part of how efficient will this process be right in terms of the yes and also uh, how efficient um well i cannot talk about, how, about the whole process because it's it's out of the scope of the research that i do but i can mm -hmm. i can do tell you that uh carbon dioxide it's very old. It's also very hard to like concentrate, you know, and take it from the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. and, and that's also a setback. Um, we also have to look for strategies that are good for absorbing carbon dioxide. Because uh, mm -hmm. here in the laboratory, we're working with a carbon dioxide tank. So we're feeding it pure carbon dioxide. So if you would, if you would uh, like to use the same system in the atmosphere under reaction, under atmospheric conditions, it will not work. Exactly. But I am doing fundamental uh, catalysis mm -hmm. and we're just trying to learn and contribute a little into this uh, scientific field. Yeah, because whatever you fund, you know, whatever, ha whatever research uh, results you get at the laboratory could fundamentally be applied into these processes at the larger scale by others. That is the idea. Particularly exactly. in, but, particular the industry field, the industry setup. Yeah, and, and it's very similar to the a pharmaceuticals where mm -hmm. yeah, where you have where there's a first phase and you're just trying mm -hmm. to I think you're just trying to look for uh, the raw materials and then you mm -hmm. it, there are different phases and different stages. And I'm probably working on the first uh, stage, just looking mm -hmm. at the reaction and which catalyst is the most active. Yep. And then somebody potentially, you know, we collaborate and sure many you know, like your group and many others do collaborate with partners. So that information that, that those discoveries and research just move from one, you know, collaboration or to one phase to the other in, to, in terms of applications of, of the knowledge that is gained. There is a question on the chat. It said, what is the most effective way to help global warming in your what is the most effective way to if help with global help. warming? So I, I think the most effective way to work with, to actually mitigate global warming would be to not produce um, CO2. But in our, but unfortunately in our uh, setting, in our environment, um, it's, it's, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the best way would be to actually don't don't produce carbon dioxide, but this is very unlikely. And so I guess that um, the most efficient way would be to move away from um, from all fossil fuels and probably consider uh, solar solar. Um, I think solar fuel has a very good. I mean, solar energy. Mm -hmm. and it has the potential to uh, really power up the planet for uh, for uh, for a long time but we still i mean and this is part of research we're still looking for strategies to capture and harness uh solar energy and it's still a work in progress mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's a it's a continuous research uh part of that right it's just finding yes. different ways to do just that um i'm gonna pivot a little bit and people can give a good uh there's one more question Luis. Can Luis expand 
<laughs> can Luis expand on, and this is, uh, there's more than one question on this piece, so I'm going to take the first one. Can Luis expand his thoughts on the hydrogen cell technology? The, automate, the mm -hmm. automotive industry has pivoted towards electric power instead of hydrogen. Does Luis see hydrogen technology advancing quickly enough to get back into the auto industry? Okay. Oh, that is a, it's a long question, but I will, obviously I will, as a, as a scientist, I am not really researching hydrogen, but I can give you what I think about it. And hydrogen, it has a big problem. And the fact that high, and, and it is the fact that hydrogen, you cannot find it in the atmosphere. It's mm -hmm. always uh, bonded with another element. So that means that to, to produce hydrogen if efficiently, you would need to remove it from the bond. So you have to apply energy. And this is called electrolysis. And for mm -hmm. the electrolysis process, you need an active catalyst. After you produce the hydrogen from this uh, cell, you need to store it somehow. And hydrogen storage is a very, uh, it, it, it's also a field in research, but it's very dangerous because hydrogen is very explosive. And uh, storing it would require probably another material. And then moving from, from the storage into the actually using it on a fuel cell, it also needs another catalyst. So it's not as simple as just hydrogen. It, I mean, hydrogen in a fuel cell, it works perfectly. But obtain, obtaining hydrogen is energy intensive. And mm -hmm. there, are, I, uh, there are those three different steps that I mentioned, and each of them requires to be optimized. And I think that that's why um, the vehicle industry has moved away from hydrogen as a potential fuel source. I think they're still, use, uh, still uh, using hydrogen as for fuel cells, but not to the extent that we were expecting 10 years ago. And it's because uh, it's energy intensive and it also requires uh, catalysts and most of the catalysts are very expensive. Expensive, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. true, that is true. Um, but it's, it's an active area of research that's still mm -hmm. going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Luis, um, we gonna take a little bit of a pivot, and we we I know we're joined by students and in teach educators um, in in our chat today. So that who may be interested in a career, students maybe just in a career in STEM and chemistry, or learning more about STEM career path in general. So mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna ask you a question that I asked have asked of our guests before. Do you always did you always know that you wanted to be a scientist? What, what was your path? What was your journey to where you are right now? This, how did you start at this? How do I, how did I start? Okay. I started um, on this path. Okay, so when I was in high school, I was always interested in science. I, I, I probably found science, the science course is the most interesting, especially mm -hmm. chemistry. But I was not really exposed. I didn't know if I if I would want to be a chemist because I don't know what a chemist did like at that time. But I I was always exposed to doctors, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and for me, like a doctor, well, he uses science, and and that's for me like the career that I ch that I want. I want to be a doctor mm -hmm. because I like science. It was normal for me because I I was not really exposed to a lot of sci of uh, the scientific track early at an early age. Mm -hmm. Now, when I went to the university, I, I, I was good at chemistry, so I decided to pursue a bachelor's degree in chemistry. And the courses were all right, like the first few years, I was not really passionate about it. Then came the third year. And on, my, on the end of the third year, I took an instrumental analysis course. Mm -hmm. And here, there was a TA that was very involved in doing... Um, creative experiments something new uh, he wanted to be he wanted to do like something out of the scope of uh, of of what you would find on a lab manual okay. and for me for me at that time i was interested in energy so i remember with the help with his help and a, and a team we 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 created a fuel cell so this was in electrochemistry oh, 
Yes, we created a fuel cell. I mean, That's it was cool. a very basic. I probably wasn't really, I, I didn't know what I was doing at the time, to be honest, but I was really involved and, in, you know, going out of the, uh, out of the lab manual. And I was really mm -hmm. interested in this. Now, after this, after the third year, where I have this first experience of doing research, well, it was not really doing research. It was only like doing a lab work. Uh, I received an email from the TA at the time mm -hmm. and saying that he, he wanted, he, need, he needed people to work on a project in collaboration mm -hmm. with NASA. And I, I was like extremely like, Ooh, wow, NASA, I, I absolutely, even if I just have to clean the glassware, I'm, I'm, I'm down for it. Perfect. <laughs> And and it was it was I mean it was super involved. I was I was really working with a team. I felt like part like uh, an integral part of that. I was doing something yeah. because it was for ammonia. Uh, it was for ammonia oxidation because mm -hmm. uh, science. Uh, I mean astronauts they need to remove uh, urine from space, and one of the mm -hmm. uh, components of urine is urea, which you can turn into ammonia, and then ammonia yeah. we oxidized it. And mm -hmm. I was completely passionate about this project and I remember uh, I, this was for my fourth year so I was already finishing my bachelor's degree and I had already applied to many medical schools so I was in the interview process and um, it came the day where I had to talk to my parents and tell them you know what um, I don't think the, the the med school thing is gonna work for me I think I'm really I really want to follow like the research and something that I like. My mother was extremely supportive. Mm -hmm. uh, my father, he didn't really understand it because um, I had to tell him like, oh, I'm not going to be a doctor, but I want, I'm going to be a different kind of doctor, you know? like a chemistry doctor. <laughs> and he didn't really understand at the time, but um, he really supported me too. Now, uh, I was on my last year, I was on my last year as a as a bachelor student, and I was already too late to apply to grad school. Mm -hmm. So I talked to my supervisor at the time, the one that I was doing the ammonia project with, and he accepted me in the lab. He said, okay, you can stay here for a year, and if you want to apply elsewhere later, because I know that you're late, you can mm -hmm. you have the liberty of doing so. And uh, well, it turned out that I really, I really liked the lab where I was working in. I liked the people that I was working in. I, I had a very good team, and I decided to stay in the lab and do electrochemistry at the time. Now, my first year as a grad student, I came here to Brookhaven National Lab for the first time, and it was a great it was it was a it was a great experience. I really enjoyed it, but I was not really too involved. Four years later, and I know this I know this is a long story. <laughs> but four years later, something happened that really changed my life, and it's Hurricane Maria. It struck mm -hmm. Puerto Rico. From one day to the next, I had no internet connection. I had no cellular re reception. Mm -hmm. It was complete chaos, and I was writing my thesis at the time. Mm -hmm. So fortunately, uh, my uh, Brookhaven National Lab, they gave me the opportunity of finishing my PhD working here. At Brookhaven, and I remember they—I uh, was part of a team. Um, mm -hmm. I was the leader of the, of the electrocatalysis team here from Puerto Rico, and we were very productive at the time. And uh, um, I was also able to finish writing my thesis. And at the end of my of my six months that I stayed here as an intern, uh, I was re I, I was more interested in pursuing a postdoc position here. So I talk here to the to my supervisor now. And he agreed for, to it and he said, excellent, uh, we'll bring you along. You know that you have to change fields because you're an electrochemist and we are in heterogeneous catalysis, different interface. But uh, two year, I've been here for two years now and it's been an excellent experience and I really enjoyed it so far. I know, I, 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 when you and I were talking, I, we, we talk about uh, you know, how we decide to, to follow you know, the path that we all take. And, and the importance of having mentors, right? Uh, the importance of Absolutely. having mentors that, that, that guide you and encourage you and the importance of, you know, exposure. Uh, like you said, I, you and I come from the same island and, uh, yes. I, and so my, my exposure to, to, to a more formal STEM 
uh, or science area was happening in college, just like here, right? In college. So, you know, we start a little early, then we can grab them even sooner. Um, and, and so yes. the value of, of mentors is important. It's, it's really important. Like you said, your mentor at the University of Puerto Rico changed your life, changed the way, changed your soul yourself. It, it, was, it was, it started all from a TA, from a uh, instrumental analysis TA. Yeah. yeah. And look yeah. where you are. So what's next? I know you're a postdoc at the lab. Uh, and so what is, what is next for you? Um, I'm still trying to figure it out. I am <laughs> I am still young, and I would really I would really try would like to try the the industry side of science. I've mm -hmm. I've been eight years already in the academia, mm -hmm. so I, I would really try like to try the industry. But at the same time, um, I really enjoy the work that I do here. I like the people. I I feel like I get along well here in this environment in a national lab. So I actually see myself working at a national lab at the like after my probably uh, moving to the industry for some time. <laughs> Who knows? I don't know. Who knows? I, I, I hope that, that you can stay here, b and We'll love to keep you, keep you, keep you hear me. I, I would like you to come to my house again and, and have dinners <laughs> and, and dinners and so forth. But I, I, I think whatever, you know, even if you go out, you know, I hope that you do come back and, and come back as, as part, as a user, or even part of our, 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 our forever working uh, scientist force here at BNL. Luis, um, if, I know you, you know, if you have to give any advice to, to our students and the audience that we have, what, what words of advice you have for some of our listeners regarding, you know, careers and, and your experiences here? Okay, so I think that the best advice that I can give you is to don't be scared and apply to as many opportunities as you can. Even if you, I mean, internship opportunities, uh, uh, fellowship opportunities, because if you, even if you don't like fully understand like all the details of how the experience will be, internships the, are probably the best way of, mm -hmm. of getting to know people, network, uh, and it also helps you develop what are called soft skills. And this is also very important in the field of science. Um, another advice that I would give is, the, especially go to a new place, is try to not compare yourself with other students or other uh, graduate students, because everybody is different and everybody takes as long as, I mean, probably people take a little bit longer to learn something, but they have other soft skills, which makes them more, which makes them valuable. There are, I mean, so many it, it's very easy to get like in this hole where you compare yourself to another person you say i will never be as smart as him but it turns out i mean building knowledge it takes time and if you if you don't really uh discipline yourself to work then it might be a little frustrating so i think about stem careers as a i mean i think of stem careers as a marathon instead mm -hmm. of a instead of a sprint it takes time and endurance to succeed in this field so even when you think that you are not um you are not the best at it you are your own competition you know so as long as you grow and each day you're better and then it's fine i mean then then you're 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 you have you have been successful it's all, right it's all about you yes mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. that's, that's my yeah, and, I, and you know, and and you mentioned something about um, you know, not so not you just taking a risk. Just say yes to whatever comes you know to you. Yes, I did internship here. All right, I'll do it. Right, and you never know where that leads. You never know where Absolutely. that goes. And, so and it opens many open. doors. Mhm. Mm and it opens. You many have to doors. keep as many doors open, right? But you have to actually <laughs> get there to open the door. Correct. Correct, and and like I like what you said that is is it is a marathon. It's it's not a, a short you know it's not a a sprint or a short distance race. Okay. Are there any other questions from our audience that we are reaching our 45 minute mark? Thank you, Luis. Thank you for for being our guest today. I uh, enjoy the conversation. I learned I learned something new about Catalyst and. Uh, 
I hope that you that you stick around for a little while, like I said, you know, so you can come to my house and, and play another round of dominoes. And, and people that don't know, Luis is a fantastic piano player. And so uh, and I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I think uh, that's something that, that we should, that you should know about him. There's one last question actually that came to, may I know what catalyst so far have you considered in your research? So the catalysts that we have considered in our research, uh, they're mostly copper based because copper is inexpensive and we can actually tune the chemistry of copper by incorporating different uh, materials. Mm -hmm. It's a very, it's a very uh, good catalyst and it's also used in the industry a lot. So copper based. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Liz? And uh, before finishing, uh, probably my best mentor is my mother. Without her, I wouldn't be here. And I'm very happy that she's <laughs> she's listening to me right now. And she's probably happy that I did this shout out too. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, she's the best Luis mentor Mom. I've had. Oh, that's so sweet, Luis. Thank you. So that's all what we have for today. Uh, thank you to Luis. Um, thank you for, for your time. Thank you for sharing your, your, your insights about the, this chemistry catalyst and your path in, uh, your career path, uh, with our viewers. Our next science, uh, Thursday is September 17, 2020. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. We'd like to thank, uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory for hosting this event today. We encourage you to check our programs. And I'm going to try to do the screen share right now and see how this is going to work. Um, I hope you can see this. Um, can you see it, Luis? I can see it well, yes. Thank you. So next Science Thursday is uh, September 17th. Uh, we encourage you to check our programs, our research uh, programs uh, and internship opportunities. Our website is wbnl.gov forward slash education. Uh, in forward slash education. Thank you, everybody. Have a safe uh, rest of your day. Thank you for joining. Enjoy the rest of your summer. Please wear your mask. See you September 17th. Good day.